Good morning. The Lord's Supper was instituted in a time of darkness. And so when we are going through dark times of our own, we can partake of communion and remember Jesus and what his sacrifice means for us. We remember him as the bread of life who gave his body so that we can have everlasting life. And he is also the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because of Jesus' one sacrifice, we will be holy and blameless in God's eyes, loved and accepted by our Father. Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That's Luke 22, verses 19 through 20. Shall we partake of the elements? Take the wafer representing Jesus' body. And the juice representing Jesus' blood. Shall we pray? Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're just humbled and honored to be gathered together in your name. We take this time of our worship service to, to remember you, Jesus, who went to the cross for each and every one of us. We know that your grace is surely sufficient for each and every one of us. And we pray that we can uphold the love that you shared for us with others out in the world. And for this, we need your help. And we give you thanks and praise. In your most precious and holy name we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. going to preach about the transfiguration. I came across a cute story about transfiguration. Raise your hand if you'd like to hear it. I guess that's the majority. Okay, here it goes. <clears throat> One day, Joe, Bob, and Dave were hiking in a wilderness area. And they came up upon a large, raising, violent river. They needed to get to the other side but had no idea how to do so. So Joe prayed to God saying, please God, give me the strength to cross the river. Poof, God gave him big arms, strong legs, a big chest. He was able to swim across the river in about two hours, although he almost drowned a couple times. Seeing this, Dave prayed to God saying, please God, Give me the strength and the tools to cross the river. Poof! God gave him a rowboat. He was able to cross the river in about a half hour after almost capsizing the boat a couple times. Baba had seen how this worked out for the other two, so he also prayed to God, but added one request to his prayer. Please, God, Give me the strength and the tools and the intelligence to cross the river. Poof! God turned him into a woman. She looked at the map, walked a few yards upstream, went across on the bridge. Transfiguration. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to read the first eight verses and the rest of it later. Matthew 17, the first eight verses. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. 
There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he's still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's Matthew 17, verses 1 to 8. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus only. The transfiguration scene must have been one of the most exciting events in the life of Peter and James and John, and maybe even for Moses and Elijah as well. And I'm convinced that it can mean a great deal to us today. As any student of biology knows, a metamorphosis is a transformation, a complete change of appearance and form. An example, when a caterpillar changes into a butterfly. That's transfiguration. Jesus certainly went through a metamorphosis, and more than once, first he left the glories of heaven to come to earth in human form, to live with us, to share our pain, suffering, and hungers and temptations. For 33 and a half years, he lived upon the face of this earth in a human form. But at the time of this scripture that we have read, Jesus coming to the end of his ministry upon this earth, and for a few minutes at a mountainside in Galilee, Peter, James, and John are privileged to see another metamorphosis. As Jesus is once again clothed in his glory, the glory of Almighty God. <clears throat> this morning, I want us to look at the transfiguration through the eyes of the Apostle John and behold what he beheld. So what did John see? As John stood in that mountain, saw the transfiguration of Jesus, what did he see? He saw the glory of God. Years later in the first chapter of the gospel, verse 14, John says, the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John knew what he was talking about, for on that mountainside they had seen Jesus transfigured, his appearance changing dramatically, his face, his clothing, shining like the light of the sun. And just as that happened, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. So awed was Peter by this sight that Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But that obviously wasn't God's plan. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. About a week before the transfiguration, Jesus had asked his disciples this question, Who do people say that I am? And they replied, Some think that you are Elijah, or Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Some even think you might be John the Baptist come back from being dead. Then Jesus asked them, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I've always wondered how the other apostles reacted when Peter said that. Did they join in saying, he's right, he's right. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter is absolutely right. Or did they look at one another in confusion? Did they turn to Peter and ask, what did you say? Why did you say that? Are you really convinced he's the Messiah? I think that there must have been some late conversation around the campfire as they discussed what Jesus had said. They re-examined his miracles, talked about the people who had come to him. Is he really the Christ, the Messiah we long for? whose coming we have prayed for again and again and again. There must have been 
many lingering questions until on the mountainside, Peter and James and John saw the glory of God. Suddenly, like the rushing of a mighty river, John was convinced that when Peter had said this, it's true. Jesus is the Christ, and that is important. You see, it's one thing to recognize that there is a God who has put the sun, the moon, and the stars in place. It's another thing to recognize that there is a God who made us and who appreciates beauty and who gives us morality, helps us to feel bad when we are bad and good when we are good. It's one thing to recognize that there is a God of order who is in control. It's another thing to recognize that God became one of us. To John, that must have been an overwhelming revelation. This Jesus who patted me on the shoulder when I was discouraged, this Jesus who prayed with me, this Jesus who dried my tears, this Jesus who concerned about my family, this Jesus who is concerned about my feelings when I'm lonely and tired, this Jesus is God? He actually is God in human flesh. Do you realize how blessed we are week after week to be able to come and share our faith together in this place that Jesus is the Christ? How blessed we are that we can do that. And just think, somebody else paid off this building. Think how blessed we are. I pray that you'll never grow tired of that. I pray that you'll proclaim it with all your power. He's the Christ, the Lord of all. John realized that as he saw the glory of Almighty God, and we need to realize it too. We need to see the glory of God. <coughs> you know, I think most of us are very much like the Apostle Philip. Do you remember? After three years of being with Jesus, seeing all the miracles, listening to his teachings, just a short time before his crucifixion, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That's John 14, verses 8 and 9. When we see Jesus, we know what God is like. For Jesus came to reflect and reveal God to us. We need to see God. We need to listen to his word. When we don't, there's a frantic attempt, I think, to reach out and find something to believe. I know it's hard to believe, but I read about a lady in New Mexico who was frying tortillas on her stove. One of them burnt, and it just so happened that the burnt formed the shape of a face. She decided that the image was the face of Jesus. She took it to her priest and asked him, do you think it looks like Jesus? He thought it looked like Jesus too, and he blessed it. He'd never blessed a tortilla before, but he blessed that tortilla. She took it home, put it in a little box, surrounded it with white cotton so that it would look like it was floating as a cloud. Then she and her husband built an altar, began to pray before it. The news spread, and soon hundreds of people were coming to see and pray before this burnt tortilla. In the past few years, crowds of people have seen what they believe to be sacred images on tree trunks and car fenders. And they have prayed devoutly before them. A few years ago, some people in Portland, Oregon, discovered a tree with a strange shape in the bark. They who discovered it was a crippled man. He decided it was the image of the Virgin Mary so he later claimed that he was healed there and he tied his crutches to the tree. 60 miles away, another tree was discovered that seemingly had the same image. So in Portland, thousands of people are buying train tickets to go to the countryside and kneel before these trees to leave their money at the foot of the trees to ask the blessing of the Virgin Mary on their lives. Why, why do people do that? because they want so desperately to see and feel the glory and the power of God. 
We all want that in our lives. We search for it. When it's not there, somehow we try to create it ourselves. We try to put it there in one way or another. We need to realize that we have a share in his glory. In John 17, Jesus prays that every wonderful prayer which he prayed just before Judas betrayed him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed for himself, for the apostles, and for all who would believe on him because of the witness of the apostles. <clears throat> in that prayer, he mentions the glory of God eight times. His prayer goes something like this, John 17. Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And a little bit later, he prays for us. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are all one. It's a shared glory. The glory is something that we share because we are Christians, because we are born again, because God's work, God works a change in each of our lives. And we can share in the glory that John saw on the mountain. But we need to watch out. There is a danger that change might be a counterfeit change, not a transformation, but a transformation, but simply a masquerade that fools most of the world and maybe even ourselves. I know that most of you know who Irma Bombeck was. In one of her articles, she wrote these words. Someone asked me the other day, if I had my life to live over, would I change anything? My answer was no. But then I thought about it. I've changed my mind. If I had my life to live over again, I would wax less and listen more. I would never have insisted the car windows be rolled up on a summer day because my hair had just been teased and sprayed. If I lived my life over again, I was taking more time to listen to my grandpa as he always talked about his youth. I would eat in less cottage cheese and more ice cream. I have gone to bed when I was sick instead of pretending the earth couldn't make it without me. When my child kissed me, I would never have said, later, now go wash up for dinner. I would have hung on to it as long as I could. But mostly, given another shot at life, I would seize every minute of it, look at it and really see, try it on, live it, exhaust it. I'll never give the minute back until there was nothing left of it. That's Irma Brockbeck's words. <clears throat> it's not with great trumpets or magnificent choirs, but in simple acts of service that we reflect and reveal the glory of God. Maybe it's a well washing dishes at home, vacuuming the carpeting, changing diapers, or caring for somebody else. Maybe it's while driving on the highway or when you display a different attitude than any of your co-workers at work. Maybe it's out there in a the world that seems so emanated from God that you can just consistently day after day witness and share, reflect and reveal the glory of God. When Peter birded out, let's stay here on the mountain and build three tabernacles, Jesus answered, <clears throat> no, we're not going to stay in the mountain. Down at the foot of the mountain, there's a boy possessed with a demon and a concerned father who has brought him. The boy's sick. We need to be there more than we need to be here. So they went down from the mountain to heal the sick boy. They went out of the world to feed the hungry, save the lost, bring the sheep back into the fold again and to reveal his glory. We who are his disciples are called to do the same thing. Feed the hungry, save the lost, bring the sheep back to the fold and reveal his glory. Let us pray. Almighty eternal God, we are thankful 
that you became flesh and dwelt among us and took our shame and sin on the cross. And I pray for these people that are gathered here today. Bless them, strengthen them, forgive them, fill them full of you. Give them a helmet of salvation to protect the evil darts on their brain. Give them the breastplate of righteousness to keep their hearts from being hurt. Guide them and direct them. I pray they sense the gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit upon them. In thy name we pray. Amen.